Good evening. Even though we have moved on to chapter 20 with our homework, there is one hanging Chad from chapter 19 that needs to be addressed, and that's heat conduction. I don't think I'll take the opportunity right now to work a problem, but I would like to draw a comparison with something that most of you are familiar with. If you took 3B already, you know about Ohm's law. It's a very simple result uh, that you can apply to a resistor in a circuit. So here's, here's a, the simplest possible electric circuit. It's got one voltage source and one, one uh, resistance element. And hopefully you recall that the current which is forced to flow through this resistor will be proportional to the potential difference placed across it. So remember in a circuit, a straight line indicates no resistance and that means there's no voltage drop between the battery terminal and one side of the resistor. So the, the voltage across the, the terminals of the battery is the same as the voltage applied across the resistor. And the current that flows is proportional to that voltage. If you apply twice the electrical pressure, as you might call it, you would expect twice, excuse me, twice the current. And we know that as resistance goes up, current goes down. So if you put three times as much resistance in here, you would expect one third the current. In other words, current is proportional to the reciprocal uh, resistance. Of course, you can put those two together and say simultaneously that current is proportional to potential difference divided by resistance. And if you choose the appropriate units for all three quantities, then you don't even need to use a proportionality symbol. You can just say that current equals voltage divided by resistance. And usually that's written uh, V equals IR or delta V equals IR. Now, let's see here. Sometimes, uh, actually not sometimes, very often in physics books, the current is written as dq dt because we do know that current is the flow of electric charge. So the number of coulombs flowing past a point per second in a circuit, that would be delta q or over delta t, or in the limit as delta t goes to zero, it would be dq dt. And I'm, I'm reviewing all this because there's a direct analogy with the conduction, not of electric charge, but of thermal energy or heat. So let's make that, that analogy now. Instead of putting uh, an electrical potential across an electrical resistor, let's put a temperature difference across something that's got what you might call thermal resistance. So, I'll call this uh, uh, an oven. Let's say you've got some kind of oven up here and down here is an ice bath or just ice water. And maybe you've got a rod made out of copper or some other metal, whatever. And you place it between these two, uh, these two reservoirs of, of heat. So this is at, I could call it T2. And this is at temperature T1. We'll assume that T2 is greater than T1. And we know that uh, heat will flow from the hotter reservoir to the colder reservoir. And let's assume that this is just air or something else that doesn't conduct heat very well at all. We know that the heat's going to flow down through this metal rod. Now, how quickly is it going to flow? Well, that depends on a number of things. Uh, the greater the temperature difference, the, the, the greater the rate at which energy might be transferred from here to here. That's analogous over here to uh, the fact that more charge will, will flow per second if you put a larger potential difference across the resistor. Here we're talking about a larger uh, temperature difference. So dq dt now, well that's going to be the number of joules per second. We're using the letter q for heat, but remember heat is just energy being transferred thermally uh, due to all those submicroscopic collisions between jiggling particles, right? That's, that's what conduction is. Hopefully you've read about that in your book. So that should be proportional to not delta V, not the voltage or potential difference, but in this case, the, the uh, temperature difference. So you can think of a temperature difference like a voltage, if you like, if that helps.
Well, if there's a, an analogous quantity to delta V, perhaps there is a quantity analogous to resistance as well. If this was made out of glass, uh, let's say it was a, a glass rod with dimensions equal to the dimensions of, of this metal rod that I was imagining, we still know that uh, even though it's the same length, perhaps same diameter, the glass is going to conduct much less or many fewer joules per second. It presents more thermal resistance, if you want to put it that way. So it's, uh, it's going to depend on the material of which this, uh, this intermediate object is made. But it's also going to depend on the dimensions. So much like an electrical resistor, let's see here, if you, if, you, um, if you look at this metal rod from the side, let's call this R1. Uh, in fact, I'm going to say R sub TH1. This is not a notation that your, your book uses, and it's not really something I'm going to use after this video. It's, I'm just doing this to make a comparison here. I'm calling this thermal resistance. And here's a, another rod of smaller diameter. I'll call this thermal resistance two. And it's pretty evident that the thermal resistance of object two should be greater than the thermal resistance of object one. Why is that? Because it's skinnier? I'm so sorry about this. I got a stupid uh, cable here. Okay, I believe I fixed that jiggling problem. That was an easy fix. I should have done that like 10 videos ago. Okay, it's pretty clear that this one has more thermal resistance because it's smaller in diameter, right? There's, there's just a, think of uh, water. Wouldn't it be easier to, to have or force water to flow through uh, a wide pipe than a narrow pipe? You've heard these analogies before in 3B. So let me label the cross-sectional area here, area one, area two, and this is, because A2 is less than A1. Okay, so if decreasing the cross-sectional area causes the resistance to go up, then we're talking about an inverse relationship there. The, uh, the thermal resistance should be proportional to the reciprocal of the cross-sectional area. The bigger that area is, uh, the more channels, you could say, that the more channels there are for, for, uh, through which heat can flow, and that would cause the resistance to go down. And then the other thing we have to worry about would be the length. So if we're talking about equal cross sections, I'll call this length L1. Here's L2. This has some thermal resistance, which I'll call R thermal one, and this is R thermal two. The thermal resistance of object two is probably going to be double that of object one, since L two is double L one. I just think of it this way. It takes time for heat to be conducted from here to here because these particles have to jiggle around and bump into the ones next to them, and then those have to bump into the ones next to them. Actually, I gotta be honest, that, that once, it's, uh, once the equilibrium state has been established, in other words, once the flow of heat has reached some steady value, like if, if you've always got 100 degrees Celsius over here and zero degrees Celsius over here, heat is flowing that way. Once you've allowed the heat flow to establish itself, I don't, I don't quite see why it would take more time. Well, it, it would take more time for heat to flow from here to here, but why should that affect the number of joules per second? Okay, so to me, there's not an obvious intuitive explanation for, for why a longer pipe should cause more resistance, but experimentally, we know that that's the case. So if doubling the length doubles the resistance, that means that your thermal resistance is proportional to length. Okay, and so if, if dq dt, sorry, thermal resistance is proportional to length. If dq dt is gonna be equal to the temperature difference divided by thermal resistance, see the analogy here with 
ohm's law current is voltage over resistance heat current you could call it that is is a temperature voltage in a manner of speaking divided by thermal resistance and i just established that that r thermal is proportional to it's proportional to length but inversely proportional to area so i would have this come up and then lastly uh, we'd have to account for we would have to account for the the conductivity of the material itself uh, like i said glass would have a lower rate of heat transfer than just about any metal so the last thing we stick in here is just that constant of proportionality. So I'll say that this depends on the material. And I believe that's called the thermal conductivity. And there's a number of problems presented in your chapter. There's some good examples in there. I think there's one about keeping a refrigerator cool. That's a great one to look at because sometimes the geometry of the problem is not so obvious. Like this, um, this length here, it's easy to visualize when you're just talking about a rod, but what if you're talking about one of those cabinets uh, style freezers that some people have in their garages? So this is the inside of the freezer. And if you could see inside, you know, all of these, these uh, walls have a thickness. How do I draw that? So you'd have to look at the heat flowing into the, the freezer through this space, into the freezer through this space, et cetera. And you'd have to apply this equation individually to each of these faces. So I believe those, there are six faces, right? You'd have to do six different calculations. Well, maybe just three because the dimensions of this face would be the same as the dimensions of the opposite face. But in this case, the, the width of the slab is what you would call L. And the, the area, the surface area there would be A. So you want to get some practice with those problems. It's really not difficult to apply this equation. There's no calculus here. I mean, it looks like it, but that's just joules per second. We're just expressing the rate of heat flow as a constant ratio. Okay, so it's, it's kind of nice to think about it in terms of Ohm's law. Uh, if I wanted to, Combine everything to uh, to complete the analogy here. If I go back, I equals delta V over I or over R, excuse me, and then this is analogous to current I. I would be equal to delta T over R. That means R thermal. Let me uh, find another place to write this. You could say dQ dt is equal to temperature difference over thermal resistance where thermal resistance evidently is l over k a the book does not use this terminology but it's you know if you find that helpful you can think about it in that way the longer your um your medium is again for the for the example of the, the cabinet freezer this would be the length of that that piece of styrofoam it's, it's really the width you know in a Everyday language, you probably call that a width, but that is L in the formula. So the longer that thing is, the more thermal resistance it would have. The higher the conductivity, this is uh, thermal con conductivity, it's in the denominator, so the higher the conductivity, the lower the thermal resistance would be. And of course, the more area you're talking about, the less thermal resistance. So just think about a home. If you, if you live in a, a small house, during the winter, you're trying to keep it warm, uh, Here's my, my silly little house here. You've got heat flowing from inside to the outside. The bigger your, whoa, the bigger your walls are, the bigger this A is. So it, it's pretty easy to see why a greater surface area would lower the thermal resistance. The lower the thermal resistance, the greater the rate at which joules are flowing from your house to the outside. Let's get some practice with those.